objection. The chair is authorized to clear recess today. Time. Today, the committee will consider the fiscal year 2022 budget views and estimates of the Committee on Transportation Infrastructure. Um, as a reminder, please keep your microphone muted or I'll yell at you. Uh, to insert a document into the record, please have your staff email it to documents, tni at mail.house.gov. And finally, the views and estimates have been distributed electronically in accordance with the rules. I now call up our only item for consideration today, the committee's fiscal year 2022 views and estimates as unanimous consent be considered as read and open to amendment at any point without objection so ordered. I now uh, recognize uh, ranking member Graves for a statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This year infrastructure is truly a top priority of everyone. Um, everyone on this committee in particular, and I hope that we can work together to pass bipartisan legislation to improve our surface transportation system, our ports and waterways, uh, wastewater infrastructure and other areas that really need to be addressed. Our views and estimates document lays out our legislative goals for this Congress, and I appreciate the chair working with us on it and uh, working with staff on it. I urge my colleagues to support the views and estimates for fiscal year 2022, and with that, I yield back. Uh, do any other members wish to be recognized to make a statement on the views and estimates? Actually, just to what? I'm sorry, we have what? Switch the back. Switch back. What? Excuse me. Um, before I comment on the document uh, that we plan to adopt uh, momentarily, document that serves as this committee's North Star for what we plan to achieve this year, I want to take a moment to congratulate six of our colleagues who have been chosen to serve as vice chairs for each of our subcommittees. They hail from six different states, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Arizona, Washington, and Georgia. They represent rural, urban, suburban communities all play a vital role as we craft um, a uh, old infrastructure uh, package that will create jobs, builds back better, and serves the needs of our nation. Uh, Connor Lamb uh, will serve as the vice chair of the subcommittee on aviation. Uh, Jake Oakenkloss will serve as the vice chair of the subcommittee on Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation. Chris Pappas will serve as the vice chair of the subcommittee on economic development, public buildings, emergency management. Greg Stanton uh, from Arizona will serve as the vice chair of the subcommittee on highways and transit. Marilyn Strickland uh, will serve as vice chair of the subcommittee on railroads, pipelines, hazardous materials. And Carolyn Bordeaux will serve as the vice chair of the subcommittee on water resources and environment. Uh, each of these subcommittees is focused on improving public safety, quality of life, fighting for policies to strengthen our communities, our country, and making uh, headway on some of our nation's biggest challenges, including uh, the, uh, the threat of climate change. That's why uh, we need to act on transformational infrastructure bill, because investing in infrastructure can address all that and more. The reality is that we're going to be successful in moving our infrastructure out of the Eisenhower era. We can't do it with yesterday's thinking. We need fresh perspectives, new ideas, and I'm confident the new vice chairs will bring just that to each and every area of jurisdiction of this committee. Uh, it, you know, uh, when, we, uh, when we ultimately succeed uh, in passing uh, an ambitious 21st century infrastructure plan, we'll create uh, millions of jobs uh, that will once again spur American innovation and ingenuity, make us more competitive in the global economy, address climate crisis, uh, and better serve uh, Americans who are tired of congested highways, potholes, bridges that collapse, water mains that burst, sewers that back up into their basement, and potholes that uh, cost them um, hundreds of dollars per year. Uh, and send them to the auto repair shop. Uh, you know, our, I believe that our nation 
Uh, and this Congress has, in particular, an incredible opportunity with President Biden, who has made infrastructure a priority. I met with him uh, several times uh, on the issue. Um, we haven't had a, a, a infrastructure week yet. Uh, we're just going to do it. Uh, no more uh, press events and fake infrastructure weeks. And uh, I know that uh, Secretary Buttigieg uh, has uh, been in touch with many of the members of the committee and invited uh, you to uh, exchange ideas with him. And uh, you know, we know that uh, this team uh, is uh, committed to finally getting uh, this done. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, they're going to need our help, and I look forward to working closely with all our chairs, our talented vice chairs, our ranking members on each of these committees. Uh, and I know we, that uh, everybody wants to move America's infrastructure and transportation systems into the 21st century and beyond. So welcome again to our new subcommittee vice chairs. Uh, and now to the business matter at hand today, considering the fiscal year 2022 budget views, estimates, and committee and transportation infrastructure is required by the Congressional Budget Act 1974 and House rules. I want to thank the ranking member, all our colleagues and minority for partnering on this document. This document, we've laid out the committee objectives, which include, among other things, making smart investments, ensuring modern, safe, and resilient infrastructure, making our transportation water systems affordable and equitable, working with our state and local partners setting a path towards zero pollution from transportation, which is currently the number one contributor to carbon emissions in the U.S., and working toward innovative solutions. I encourage anyone closely tracking the work of this committee, or anyone who's just learning about this committee, to read the full document. Clearly, uh, we have a lot of areas of mutual interest, uh, plenty of common ground. Let's get to work on behalf of the American people. We've made it overwhelmingly clear. They want this Congress and this committee to deliver on investments to improve lives in every community in this country. Uh, and I recognize the ranking member for, uh, I, well, I maybe wants, what, okay, the scripts are not very good today. Okay, do any other, uh, unless Sam wants to speak again, do any other members wish to be recognized? Uh, hearing none. Uh, are there any amendments to the fiscal year 2022 budget views and estimates? Uh, hearing none. Uh, the question is now on adoption of fiscal year 2022 budget views and estimates of the Committee on Transportation Infrastructure. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying nay. The ayes have it and our views and estimates are adopted. Pursuant to House Rule 10, Clause 4F, the views and estimates of the Community Transportation Infrastructure will be submitted to the Committee on the Budget. Uh, without objection, staff is authorized to make technical clarifying, conforming changes to the fiscal year 2022 views and estimates. Pursuant to House Rule 11, 2L, members have at least two calendar days in which to file a supplemental minority. Additional dissenting views on text approved day pursuant to Rule 6 of the Committee on Transportation Infrastructure. Chair notes the presence of a quorum between the virtual and the actual uh, and for all actions taken on all committee business today. With that, the Committee on Transportation Infrastructure has completed its important business for the day and the committee is adjourned. <laughs>
Testing audio 2167. You guys don't need to respond. Just give me a thumbs up on Teams. All right, 2167 testing. You guys can give me a little audio. I just want to make sure we're hearing everything coming through into the room and check the levels. Yeah. Testing, 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 one, two, three. Can you hear me, Larry? Yep, all good. Thanks. Uh-huh, no problem.
sustainable water, wastewater infrastructure and measures to promote resiliency and climate adaptation and mitigation. Let me begin by asking unanimous consent that the chair be authorized to declare a recess at any time during today's hearing and without objection so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that members not on the subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's hearing and ask questions and without objection so ordered. As the chair of today's hearing, I will make a good faith effort to provide every member experiencing connectivity issues, and I just did, an opportunity to participate fully in the proceedings. Please let committee members know as soon as possible if you are experiencing connectivity issues or technical problems. It is the responsibility of each member seeking recognition to unmute their microphone prior to speaking. To avoid any inadvertent background noise, I request that every member keep their microphone muted when not seeking recognition to speak. Should I hear any inadvertent ground background noise, I will request that the member please mute their microphone. And finally, to insert a document to the record, please have your staff email it to documents tni at mail.house.gov. Um, now for my, my statement, um, today is a, uh, a good day to do this. We will continue to discuss the new, the need to renew the federal commitment to fund our clean water infrastructure challenges. In our first committee here, subcommittee hearing of this Congress, we discussed legislative proposals to close the gap between local wastewater and stormwater needs and current levels of federal investment, as well as to ensure these critical investments are sufficient to help these communities address local water quality challenges. The first of these proposals approved by this committee last Congress and ultimately approved by the House in HR2, the Moving Forward Act would have provided a robust funding for the clean water state revolving farm known as SRF, but ultimately stalled in the Senate. This Congress, I joined with Chairman DeFazio, Congressman Fitzpatrick in introducing HR 1915, the Water Quality Protection Job Creation Act of 2021 a proposal that received unanimous support from the witnesses at our February hearing on Building Back Better. The robust funding levels in this bipartisan proposal are critical to addressing the $270 billion backlog over the next 20 years, according to the US EPA in wastewater and stormwater upgrades identified by states and our communities. Similarly, in this American Jobs Plan, President Biden further stressed the importance of water and wastewater investment, not only for the number of jobs it will create, but also how these investments are safe and efficient and sustainable water infrastructure are critical to health and the well being of every American. So let's be clear no one has ever had a sewer backup in the community or home, or who has gotten sick from swimming in a contaminated river, lake, or beach, or who has questioned the safety and or reliability of the water coming out of the faucet would ever say that water infrastructure is not infrastructure. Tomorrow marks the 51st anniversary of Earth Day. Let's celebrate it. In recognition of this anniversary, it is fitting we continue to focus on meeting our clean water infrastructure needs, but also highlight how resilient and sustainable approaches we utilize to make this investment can both meet the goals of the Clean Water Act, but do so in a way that increases the overall protection of human health and the health of our environment. At this moment, we are witnessing that the generational changes in how wastewater utilities are meeting the wastewater challenges facing our nation. As our witnesses will testify, many communities are leading the way in increasing the resiliency and sustainability of the wastewater utilities from converting waste to energy to reducing greenhouse gas emissions of water utilities to investing in nature and nature-based green water infrastructure alternatives, to relieve pressure on existing sewer systems, to recapturing and reusing water and stormwater for both the non-potable and drinking water needs of local communities. Many utilities are leading the example of how to create the so-called utility of the future. In fact, some communities have used the need to upgrade their water infrastructure as an opportunity to reinvest them, to reinvent themselves using wastewater and stormwater practices to increase the livability of cities and suburbs while also addressing local water challenges. Today's hearing 
is an opportunity to reveal and explore some of these innovative and cost-effective alternatives to traditional wastewater infrastructure solutions. We must research and invest in these technologies and share the information on development and benefits amongst water agencies so that we are not reinventing the wheel. Today's hearing also presents us with the opportunity to discuss some of the challenges that are preventing wider awareness or utilization of these sustainable alternatives to address local water quality needs, especially in rural, tribal, and economically disadvantaged communities. As I mentioned earlier, we all know that the documented wastewater and stormwater needs facing our nation are great and require a renewed and robust federal commitment to help address them. However, the country's urgent wastewater infrastructure needs also present a major opportunity to upgrade, modernize, and increase the sustainability of the nation's uh, war related water infrastructure. Uh, of course, this presents a great challenge, and it is our great challenge how to both increase the federal investment in wastewater infrastructure and to make sure that these investments maximize those resiliency and sustainability of our wastewater utilities. I look forward to continuing the discussion here this morning. And at this time, I'm pleased to use to my great colleague, the ranking member of subcommittee, Mr. Rouser, for any thoughts you may have. Thank you, Chair Napolitano, for holding this hearing uh, today. And thank you to our witnesses for being here to provide their experiences and thoughts on actions designed to encourage greater resiliency and sustainability of wastewater utilities. Specifically, we'll hear how these can help in meeting the requirements of the Clean Water Act. In particular, I'd like to thank Mr. Kim Colson, Director of the Division of Water Infrastructure in my home state at the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. Mr. Colson is also the current president of the Council of Infrastructure Financing Authorities, so he's in a great position to provide insight on the needs of communities, not just from the state of North Carolina, but for the country. In February, in February, we held a hearing on the broader topic of replacing and updating our nation's wastewater infrastructure. Today, we're going to get a little more specific and look at the energy challenges facing wastewater infrastructure. It certainly makes sense for wastewater utilities to want to be as efficient and resilient as possible. According to the EPA, for many municipalities, drinking water and wastewater facilities are their largest user, users of energy, often consuming 30 to 40 percent of their energy totals. EPA also notes that drinking water and wastewater operations account for 2 percent of the country's overall energy use. And it's fairly easy to see why. These facilities often use very large machinery, including pumps, drives, motors, and other equipment which operate 24 hours a day. Additionally, many facilities were designed and built in an era when energy costs were not as a big, big a concern. So clearly it makes sense to discuss, discuss energy use at these facilities. EPA has noted that if municipalities incorporate energy efficiency practices into their water and wastewater plants, utilities can save 15 to 30%. But you also have to consider the opportunity cost, especially for small municipalities. An important part of today's hearing is learning more about why a utility may not have an incentive to implement such measures. In addition to wastewater utility, utility energy use, we are also going to hear about resiliency and mitigation of natural disasters. As municipalities grapple with hurricanes, flooding, earthquakes, and other disasters, we need to think about this. Today, we're gonna to hear a lot about green infrastructure referring to measures that use plant or soil systems or permeable surfaces to manage wet weather impacts. Under current federal law, all clean water state re revolving fund programs must use a portion of their federal grant for projects that address green infrastructure, water, and energy efficiency or other environmental activities. While these practices and technologies may very well benefit some communities, it is essential that these programs did not take a one-size-fits-all approach. Some communities, especially small and rural communities, may not have the means or the need to utilize these specific practices in their communities. Small and rural communities often have difficulty using the green infrastructure reserve and identifying projects in this category that can be successfully implemented in their communities. 
For example, while permeable pavement and other surfaces may be important to combat stormwater runoff in a large city, is there really the best use of funding for a community of the few thousand? Now, this is not necessarily suggestive of an opinion, but just a question, I think, that needs to be answered. I also look forward to hearing more about these issues from our panel of experts here today. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Rouser. Uh, at this time, I'm pleased to yield to our wonderful chairman of the, Conservative Committee, of the committee, full committee, Mr. DeFazio, for any thoughts he may have. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair Napolitano, and thanks for uh, holding uh, this hearing. It's uh, particularly uh, auspicious that we're here uh, the day before Earth Day uh, to discuss uh, the sustainability of the nation's wastewater infrastructure. Um, you know, I, I remember when uh, the Willamette River in Oregon was an open sewer. Uh, it's now a source of drinking water and uh, it is a, a fabulous recreational amenity and we're finally opening up my largest city uh, down to the river with a fabulous new waterfront park uh, which will be heavily utilized. But uh, in the old days, you wouldn't have wanted to go down there. Uh, other parts of the country have a long way to go, but they have made uh, some progress. Uh, in D.C., they used to have signs saying if you made contact with the water or fell into the water, you needed to go to the hospital. Um, it's not so bad today, but it's still nowhere near where uh, it needs to be or wants to be to turn uh, the Potomac uh, and the Anacostia all into similarly fabulous uh, recreational uh, opportunities uh, for the community and fishing and other things. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we have documented the needs uh, through the EPA, $270 billion over the next 20 years to bring the nation's wastewater systems up to uh, a, uh, you know, a state of good repair and adequate uh, resilience uh, to deal with uh, future events. That's uh, that be $14 billion uh, per year, approximately. Uh, and obviously there's, uh, you know, a question of uh, can local communities do this in, on their own? And the answer is no. Uh, the federal government used to be a good partner. When I was a county commissioner, we got a 75% federal match because uh, polluted water does not observe, uh, you know, either city, state, county, or even international boundaries. Uh, and, you know, so it is a problem that needs to be dealt with with a national strategy and as the ranking member pointed out that some of the uh, ambitious programs to clean the water are burdens on small communities and we need to partner uh, with those communities and, and help them to meet these challenges. Uh, last year uh, the appropriators uh, they put into the clean water SRF 1.6 billion. Um, that would be uh, somewhere around 10 percent. 12% of uh, the annual need. Uh, so we, we are nowhere near where we need to be. Uh, and, you know, we held the hearing in February uh, where we uh, documented the fact that many local communities can't do this. Uh, again, especially small, rural, economically disadvantaged. They just don't have revenues. They don't have a sufficient number of ratepayers to bear the costs and the burdens. So, um, you know, if we remain committed, then we only we can get there is with a new robust federal commitment uh, to cleaning up our wastewater. And at the same time as we do it, we have great opportunities to transform and modernize. Uh, you know, the, uh, we had testimony uh, in a year, well, in the last Congress in January, February from a wastewater district in New Jersey that had to rebuild their system uh, electricity is really expensive in New Jersey. They're capturing their methane, uh, a horrendous uh, greenhouse gas, way worse uh, than CO2, uh, generate electricity to run the plant, uh, saving them a tremendous amount of money and selling energy onto the grid. So how about that? Uh, we're dealing with uh, uh, climate change, a horrible pollutant, methane. Uh, we're lowering uh, costs uh, for ratepayers. Uh, and, uh, you know, that seems like a win-win-win for everybody, and uh, that's something that we should look at replicating as these systems are rebuilt. Uh, right now, uh, the uh, 
EPA and Department of Energy that, uh, you know, drinking and wastewater, treatment of drinking water and wastewater, is about 4% of our nation's energy use. Uh, that's uh, about $4 billion at average cost uh, across the country. Uh, 45 million tons of greenhouse gases, that's 10 million cars a year. Uh, and um, there is way uh, more methane uh, in the wastewater and escaping from the wastewater than uh, we need uh, to for the treatment. And that could be, as I said, uh, uh, could be trapped and could become a, a generation uh, of, for electricity and uh, reduce the uh, destructiveness of, of the methane uh, in the atmosphere. And, uh, you know, the, the APA estimates that uh, doing actions like this could save 10 to 40 percent of operating costs for utilities around the country. And, you know, the other issue is, of course, uh, the resilience of these facilities. Severe weather events, floods, uh, overtopping uh, submerging systems, uh, sea level rise, uh, challenging systems uh, in coastal areas. Uh, and, uh, you know, in 2020, the, the U.S. Government Accountability Office uh, studied uh, the re resiliency of water and wastewater and recommended that uh, one of the recommendations to us, to Congress, was uh, that we should consider requiring the climate resilience be considered or be part of planning for any federally uh, funded wastewater uh, or water infrastructure projects. Uh, so, you know, we don't want to uh, pour money into outdated, inefficient infrastructure, infrastructure that is not going to meet the challenges of the future. Instead, uh, we need, uh, as we do in service transportation, uh, we need to uh, be begin to build out a 21st century wastewater, drinking water uh, infrastructure to better meet the needs, the health of the American people and the economy. Uh, with that, I yield back to balance my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I uh, will now ask the unanimous consent to add the testimony for the record for, from American Rivers and without objection, so ordered. Thank you for everybody. That was uh, excellent, uh, Mr. DeFazio. I think you covered it all. We will now proceed to hear from our witnesses who will testify. Thank you for being here and much welcome to everybody. On today's panel, we have Howard Keurig, Executive Director, the Water Center at University of Pennsylvania. Keisha Powell, COO and Executive Vice President, DC Water. Mr. Robert Ferrante, Chief Engineer and General Manager, Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. Kim Colson, Director, Division of Water Infrastructure, North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, testifying on behalf of the Council of Infrastructure Financing Authority, CIFA. Kevin Robert Perry, fellow American Society of Landscape Architects, and Rebecca Hammer, Deputy Director of, of Federal Water Policy, the Natural Resources Defense Council in RDC. And without objection, your prepared statements will be entered in the record. All witnesses are asked to limit their remarks to five minutes. And uh, Mr. Kier New Newkirk, am I pronouncing it right? You got it, that last time you got it very well. Newkirk. Welcome. You, sorry if I murder it. I'm not that, that good at names sometimes. Welcome, and you may proceed. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman, and uh, thank you, Chairman uh, uh, DeFazio and Ranking Member for, for uh, great opening statements, and good morning. Um, um, I thank you for holding this uh, important hearing on the role of sustainable water, wastewater infrastructure in promoting resilient cities. I am Howard Newkrug. I'm the Executive Director of the Water Center at Penn. The Water Center is a nonprofit applied research arm of the University of Pennsylvania. Our primary purpose is to find solutions to the challenges facing our urban and rural water systems, the watersheds that support them, and the communities that rely on them. Our work builds heavily on the concept of integrated water systems and the values of equity, justice, and community resilience. America's water infrastructure requires significant renewal and upgrade. I think we all know about the uh, our, uh, American Society of Civil Engineers report card with grades of minus, uh, C minus, D plus, and D. Speaking as a professor from, the, uh, from an Ivy League university, I can tell you that these are not good grades. 
These are the grades of systems that are highly vulnerable to partial or complete failure. This has to change. If America cannot afford to provide clean and safe water to all of its citizens, what nation can? The last major federal funding program of, uh, for water infrastructure came with the Clean Water Act's construction grants program in the 1970s and 1980s. The program was a huge success and improved our nation's water quality dramatically, but much more needs to be done now. Our vision is for fishable, swimmable, drinkable, accessible, attractive, and safe water that supports community health and sustainability, enhances economic opportunities, and promotes affordable and resilient neighborhoods. Our goal is to rebuild our nation's water systems with new innovations and technologies that will take our 19th and 20th century infrastructure, which is what is in place today, and secure, and, and secure it for at least through the 21st century. Today, the nation's wastewater facilities are moving from being a major user of energy to a net zero or even a net positive energy facility. That is, water systems are generating enough energy in-house to not just run as operations independent of the energy grid, but enough to sell back access to the community. We are achieving this by reducing the amount of stormwater that infiltrates or inflows into our sewers. We are using more energy efficient equipment and pumps. We are also investing in advanced digitization and artificial intelligence to better monitor and optimize our systems. And we are even producing renewable energy by using wind turbines, floating photovoltaic solar cells in our reservoirs, and optimizing methane gas generation and recovery and reuse. We are also beginning to recover other resources from the waste stream, phosphorus, microplastics, carbon, rare earth materials, fertilizers, and even the thermal heat resident in the water. And perhaps most significantly is the recovery of the water itself. We can now treat wastewater to a level appropriate for reuse, even to the level of direct potable reuse. Increasingly, clean water utilities are becoming leaders of sustainability in their communities. This June, Philadelphia Water will hit a milestone, its 10th anniversary of the groundbreaking Green Cities Clean Waters Initiative. In just 10 years, Philadelphia has greened previously impervious land, land area sufficient to prevent three billion gallons a year of combined sewage overflow uh, from entering its streams and rivers. But Philadelphia is just 25% of its way towards its ultimate discharge reduction goal. And the next 15 years will require an even greater influx of money and innovation. In summary, the renewal and upgrade of our nation's water infrastructure will be extensive and expensive, while great strides have been made to make the water sector more efficient, more re resilient, more sustainable, and more equitable, still more resources are needed. The Clean Water SRF has been a tremendous lifeline to for all parts of our water sector, and thank you for that. But our water challenges will only continue to increase, an increase in federal appropriations under the Clean Water uh, SRF program uh, would help bring the water sector and the country closer to 21st century standards and uh, our nation's expectations for resili resiliency and sustainability. So thank you for Congress's uh, continued support of funding the SRF system. I look forward to a growing partnership moving forward. And by working together, we can ensure safe, reliable and affordable water services for every citizen. Every citizen. Thank you, this concludes my remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Newkirk. Now I recognize uh, Representative Norton to introduce Mr. Powell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for this important hearing and for inviting uh, our own uh, chief, uh, uh, chief Operating Officer of D.C. Water. I am pleased to introduce uh, Keisha Powell, uh, who has been the Authority's Chief Operating Officer uh, since May of 2020. She is leading uh, our authority's initiatives to develop water equity uh, as a roadmap. And she is importantly leading uh, measures to, oper oper uh, to, to operationalize climate resilience. Uh, she's well qualified as a graduate of the Clarence Mitchell School of Engineering, where, 
Uh, she is a professional engineer, has been vice president of the National Association of Clean Water Agencies. We welcome Ms. Powell to this hearing. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Ms. Powell, you may proceed. You got to unmute, unmute. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Norman, for the introduction, and uh, thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Chairs DeFazio and Napolitano, Ranking Member Rouser, and all members of the subcommittee for the invitation to testify before you today on behalf of DC Water, our Board of Directors, and CEO David Gaddis on Sustainable Wastewater Infrastructure. My name is Keisha Powell, and I am the Chief Operating Officer of DC Water, which provides essential drinking water service to over 672,000 residents, schools, and businesses in the district, as well as wastewater treatment service for 1.6 million people across the district and neighboring communities in Maryland and Virginia. I also serve as Vice President of the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, or NACWA, representing more than 330 public clean water utilities nationwide. We commend the committee for focusing today's hearing on modernizing and replacing the country's aging water and wastewater infrastructure, which remains a pressing concern. In fact, adapting and improving infrastructure to meet changing climate trends may be the nation's most glaring public works need. And we must not forget that no community is resilient without affordable, accessible water. We also applaud the Biden-Harris administration for its demonstrated commitment to water infrastructure investment. Both the president's infrastructure proposal and his proposed budget to Congress are historic, significant, and critical to protecting the health and well-being of every American. These investments reflect the critical role that water infrastructure will play in building back better and addressing climate change. While the causes of climate change relate to air pollution, the impacts of climate change, increasingly volatile precipitation patterns, drought, floods, intensifying storms, rising sea levels, and coastal erosion are almost all related to water. And that means water utilities will be front and center in addressing these growing, growing challenges. Utilities nationwide are keenly aware that making their communities more resilient to climate change is also an equity and environmental justice issue. At DC Water, our belief is that we cannot achieve resilience without water equity, making sure that all communities are resilient in the face of a changing climate and likewise share in the economic, social, and environmental benefits of the systems we manage and the infrastructure investments that are made. At the heart of DC Water's efforts to modernize wastewater infrastructure is our DC Clean Rivers Program, a 2.7 billion investment which uses both traditional gray and green infrastructure to reduce combined sewer overflow volume, flooding and manage stormwater runoff. Yet even an investment of this scale can be susceptible to extreme events like the September 10th flash flood where three inches of rain fell on the district over a two hour period, leaving more than 300 residents impacted by sewer backups and surface flooding. These types of extreme storms are not unique to the DC region. They are occurring throughout the country with increasing frequency and intensity, straining public clean water utility infrastructure and threatening regulatory compliance. More than a decade ago, NACWA and the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies released a report detailing the potential impact of climate change and the estimated adaptation costs for critical water and wastewater facilities of between 448 to 944 billion through 2050. These costs underscore the importance of the committee's work on the recently introduced Water Quality Protection and Job Creation Act of 2021. This timely bill authorizes substantially increased funding, including grants for wet weather and resiliency pilot projects, bridging the growing gap in the federal cost share of water infrastructure, which is currently less than 5%. This funding will allow communities to maintain and improve local infrastructure, ensure water quality, support water equity, and protect public health. But we're not only working to adapt to climate change, clean water utilities around the country are also contributing to climate mitigation measures through renewable energy projects that achieve reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and ultimately contribute to carbon neutrality goals. 
thank you for this opportunity to testify before you for the work you are, and for the work you are doing on behalf of the public clean water sector. DC Water's motto is water is life. Today, we urgently ask Congress to align funding levels with this basic truth and ensure that water infrastructure allocations are proportionate to or greater than other infrastructure sectors. This concludes my testimony and I would be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Powell. That's very good. Uh, we certainly uh, do need to focus on aging infrastructure and the new uh, methodology. I am pleased to introduce Mr. Robert Ferrante, who is the general manager of LA County Sanitation Districts. The Sanitation District is an incredible leader in water recycling, food waste recycling, and alternative waste disposal opportunities. And I know them very well. I've visited them several times. I thank you, Mr. Ferrante, for testifying today. You may proceed. Good morning and, and thank you for that introduction, Chair Napolitano. Uh, good morning also to uh, Chair DeFazio, uh, Ranking Member Rouser, members of the subcommittee and staff. My name is Robert Ferrante. I am the Chief Engineer and General Manager of the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. It is my great pleasure to participate in this hearing this morning on behalf of the sanitation districts and to speak to you about the important topic of climate resiliency and the role that wastewater agencies can play in it. I'd like to begin by stating my agency support for HR 1915, the Water Quality Protection and Job Creation Act of 2021. We thank you for bringing this very important legislation forward. As a matter of background, the sanitation districts were formed in 1923 and today we provide wastewater and solid waste services to about 5.6 million people 78 cities and unincorporated Los Angeles County. Many of our customers live in disadvantaged communities and have been hit hard by COVID-19. Our facilities are not waste treatment or disposal sites. They are resource recovery facilities that support the goal of a more circular economy. And over the last 50 years, the sanitation districts have been the nation's largest producer of recycled water. In recent years, the need though to develop additional local recycled water supplies and the need to seek out more greenhouse gas reductions has become more apparent than ever as we experience the impacts from uh, climate change. With this as a backdrop, I'd like to highlight two major projects that we have undertaken. First, we're partnering with the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California which serves nearly 19 million people through six Southern California counties on a regional recycled water project. Discussions for this project started in uh, 2010 and in 2019, a $17 million, 500,000 gallon per day demonstration facility began operation. The potential full scale regional uh, project would produce up to 150 million gallons per day or enough to serve 500,000 homes, or uh, in context with Metropolitan's uh, supply need, about 10% of Metropolitan's water supply need for the, for the Southern California region. Purified water from the advanced uh, treatment system would be delivered through 60 miles of pipeline to the region's groundwater basins, replenishing them, and also to two of Metropolitan's water treatment plants. In November of the past year, the boards of directors of both agencies approved moving forward with the environmental review, preliminary engineering and public outreach, which are anticipated to take two to three years. The project's estimated to cost 3.4 billion. And while most of the costs will be paid by ratepayers, we will be looking for financing through federal programs in order to help keep drinking water costs affordable for Southern Californians. The other project I'd like to talk about is a food waste to energy uh, project. And uh, we've developed this since we uh, have both a solid waste and wastewater infrastructure. Uh, it really makes uh, a lot of sense for us to be involved in this. It's a perfect fit for us. 
And California here, as many of you know, has an extensive set of state laws to support greenhouse gas uh, mitigation, increased use of renewable energy and diversion of waste, especially organic waste from landfills. So we have embarked on a food waste diversion for co-digestion at our main plant. And following four years of research and pilot testing, we have initiated the large program working with a number of private haulers that are serving local cities. And we currently receive about 300, 300 tons per day of food waste. And we have the potential to double that amount over the next few years. And as I think Chairman DeVazio mentioned and others about generating additional uh, uh, gas and energy, we use that biogas in two ways. We use it at, at an on-site power plant, making that power plant energy self, making the whole treatment plant energy self-sufficient and exporting power to the grid. And we also uh, use that and convert that gas into vehicle fuel, which uh, displaces not only of course, Mr. Ferranti, uh, would you yeah. mind wrapping up a little bit? Sure. It displaces uh, fossil fuel use and avoided landfill gas emissions. I hope these projects serve as good examples. And with that, I'd like to thank the subcommittee for allowing me to testify. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ferranti. Those are great projects, and I've visited most of them. Uh, Mr. Colson, you are next. You may proceed. Thank you. Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, Chairman Napolitano, and Ranking Member Rouser. My name is Kim Colson, and I am the Director of the Division of Water Infrastructure for the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. I am also President of the Council of Infrastructure Financing Authorities, and today I'm speaking on behalf of CEFA, whose members are the Clean Water and Drinking Water State Revolving Funds. Thank you for engaging the SRF community in this important conversation about the future of the Clean Water SRFs. The Clean Water SRFs provide a sustainable and perpetual source of funding for clean water infrastructure. Because the SRFs are subsidized loan programs, federal and state funding is used over and over again to fund water infrastructure forever. We are still using the initial federal investment in the Clean Water SRF from 1989. The numbers tell an incredible story of success. In 2020, Congress provided $1.6 billion in annual funding for the Clean Water SRFs, but the SRFs were able to provide $7.6 billion in assistance to communities, nearly five times the federal appropriation. Over the life of the program, $47 billion in federal funding has generated $145 billion in total investment in clean water infrastructure. Today, 60 billion, 15 billion more than the total federal funding remains revolving in the Clean Water SRFs for new loans. And those new loans are funding important water infrastructure projects that may never have been built with a conventional grant program. Maintaining the integrity of the SRFs as a loan program is essential. Every dollar provided in principal forgiveness and grants is permanently removed from the SRFs which means less funding for water infrastructure for future generations. These aspects are carefully considered at the state level. The Clean Water SRFs are a national model for infrastructure investment because states can customize their program within a broad federal framework to meet diverse and often unique needs of their communities. Understanding the impact of federal policies on these state-run programs is important to maintaining and strengthening the effectiveness of the SRFs. Many states are focused on specific types of green projects, and some are more focused on small communities, depending on their state's specific situation. Energy efficiency projects are typically funded as many utilities are exploring, reducing their energy footprint, and have established revenue streams to repay the loans. Water recycling projects are a priority in states where water scarcity is a major concern, such as California, Florida, and Texas. Stormwater projects, such as permeable pavement and roof gardens can be a great solution in urban areas. But these type projects may not be the immediate priority in small communities, and I know our small communities in North Carolina are struggling just to maintain their infrastructure. 
more federal mandates may have the unintended consequence of turning these proven effective state run programs into a one size fits all federal program. Small and rural communities like Tabor City, North Carolina with a population of 4,000 face very different challenges than cities and urban centers like Los Angeles, California with a population of 4 million. Large utilities are more likely to have the professional staff to comply with federal mandates. Small communities are more likely to have to hire an outside contractor to comply and can struggle with organizational and financial capacity. All treatment works, whether a significant overhaul or a simple pipe replacement, have the same federal requirements under current law. So on behalf of the borrowers, please consider how current and new federal mandates might impact the communities we serve, specifically consider their capacity to comply and the cost benefits. In addition, please consider ways federal policies can be implemented with state programs to meet the same federal goals, just like the SRFs already do with environmental review. Thank you again for your support and for asking the SRF communities our thoughts on the future of the Clean Water SRFs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Colson. That was uh, very insightful. Uh, Ms. Mr. Perry, you may proceed. Well, thank you, Chair Napolitano, Ranking Member Rouser, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify on the valuable work being done by landscape architects in the water and stormwater management space. My name is Kevin Robert Perry, and I'm a lands uh, licensed landscape architect and internationally recognized leader in successfully integrating stormwater management with high quality urban design. I work as a senior landscape architect at Tool Design Group, and I'm also the founder of Urban Rain Design, a small design studio based in both California and Oregon. I'm here today on behalf of the American Society of Landscape Architects, or ASLA, where I've been a fellow since 2017. ASLA believes that water quality is essential to our economy, communities, and environment. By working to protect it, our membership of landscape architects plays a critical role in sustainability and public health. Unsustainable development practices and continued expansion of paved surfaces increases stormwater runoff, carries pollutants into waterways, prevents groundwater recharge, and drastically reduces the landscape's ability to respond to everyday storm events, much less the current and future challenges of climate change. While the United States has generally had success in protecting water quality, EPA research has found that non-point source pollution remains the leading cause of water quality problems. This is where landscape architects are stepping up and playing a key role. We are at the forefront of developing innovative design strategies that promote sustainability, resiliency, and a balanced vibrancy between our built and natural environment. We plan to design nature-based systems that reduce the impacts of urbanization, integrate these solutions seamlessly into our cities and towns. And in general, our multifunctional design approach allows for a less destructive human relationship with the natural environment. Landscape architecture practices also provides a key equity and environmental justice solution. One such practice is performing meaningful community engagement during the design and planning process. Often the communities that stand to benefit the most from our work are the low income and racially diverse communities that have been damaged by years of underinvestment and disinvestment. This includes communities located in small towns, large cities and all areas in between. ASLA and its members are committed to utilizing our trade to directly improve the lives of underinvested communities. Green infrastructure also leads to job creation. According to the National Organization Green for All, a $188 billion investment in stormwater management would generate $265 billion in economic activity and create nearly 1.9 million jobs. Furthermore, green infrastructure is, is good for small businesses as many landscape architects work for or run their own small firms. It is important to also know that green infrastructure can be implemented across a wide range of scale. Resilient coastlines, riverfronts, regional parks, and interconnected green streets can be realized at the citywide scale, while rain gardens and a robust use of street trees can grace nearly any neighborhood space. With thousands of our schools, roads, parks, and other civic space infrastructure either breaking down or inefficiently designed, there is an incredible opportunity to boldly retrofit our built environment with long-lasting green infrastructure strategies. And one avenue of green infrastructure that's starting to take root on the West Coast is the, the design-build concept of tactical green infrastructure. 
This unique student practitioner partnership identifies, designs, and constructs expedited green infrastructure projects within a couple of months and directly involves the local community through the process. While originating in Oregon and California, we believe that a coordinated tactical green infrastructure program could be expanded to every state within the United States. ASLA and its members appreciate the committee's support for legislation promoting green infrastructure, including the Water Quality Protection and Job Creation Act of 2021. We also appreciate the committee's support for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and specifically the Green Project Reserve, which mandates that at least 10% of funds are used by states for green infrastructure projects. Many landscape architecture projects would not be possible without the help of this program. For these reasons, ASLA is supportive of increased funding to the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, making the Green Project Reserve permanent increasing its minimum percentage and allowing funding for the long-term maintenance of green infrastructure projects. With that, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today. ASLA looks forward to working with you and your colleagues to ensure that Congress leverages the field of landscape architecture when striving for its climate adaptation and sustainability goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Perry. It was very interesting because there are several in my area that I've visited and they're very nice. Uh, we move on to Ms. Hammer. Ms. Hammer, you may proceed. Thank you, Chair Napolitano, and good morning, Chair DeFazio, Ranking Member Rouser, and members of the subcommittee. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Becky Hammer, and I'm the Deputy Director of Federal Water Policy for the Natural Resources Defense Council. NRDC is an international nonprofit organization working to protect public health and ensure a safe, sustainable environment for all people. And that includes clean water. Everyone in America should have access to wastewater and stormwater infrastructure that works. No matter where they're located, these systems should provide communities with clean waterways, effective sanitation, and protection from urban flooding. That's not the reality for far too many people. Across the country, polluted runoff and sewage degrade our sources of drinking water, while rainwater floods our streets and homes. And of course, climate change is only making matters worse, as Ms. Powell already described so vividly. And the impacts of failing infrastructure and our change in climate fall disproportionately on low-income communities and communities of color who already bear the burden of unaffordable water and sewer costs. In light of these threats, wastewater and stormwater systems must take steps to become more resilient and sustainable, as so many are already doing. One of the best ways to do that is by using green infrastructure, which manages water by capturing it where it falls using vegetation, soils, and permeable surfaces. Green infrastructure reduces stormwater volumes, leading to cleaner waterways, reduced wastewater treatment needs, less flooding, and increased groundwater supplies. It's adaptable and it's cost effective. And critically, unlike single purpose hard infrastructure that's designed solely to move stormwater away from the built environment, green infrastructure provides multiple benefits to communities. It helps build resilience to flooding and other climate impacts. And it also provides climate mitigation benefits by storing carbon and reducing energy demand. And because many of green infrastructure's benefits are hyper-local, project implementation can be geographically targeted to enhance equity and improve access to green space in underserved areas. The federal government should use every tool at its disposal to encourage the use of green infrastructure, including the Clean Water State Revolving Fund's Green Project Reserve, a significant source of funding for green infrastructure and water and energy efficiency projects that's nonetheless been underutilized. Since the establishment of the Green Project Reserve in 2009, only 11% of total clean water SRF assistance has gone to green reserve projects, with less than 3% going to green infrastructure specifically. Up till now, the Green Project Reserve has been enacted year to year in appropriations bills, and the amount allocated to it has fluctuated over time. This approach makes potential applicants uncertain about whether the reserve will be available to support their projects in future years, depressing long-term demand for funds. Congress can help the Green Project Reserve function more effectively by codifying it in statute, making it a permanent and stable source of funding. Ideally, 20% of the annual SRF capitalization grant would be set aside for green projects. Just as importantly, Congress should provide significantly more money for the Clean Water SRF as a whole, at least the $8 billion per, per year that's proposed in HR 1915. Our communities have hundreds of millions of dollars in need with costs increasing and the pandemic stressing utilities finances. Increasing the total amount of federal investment would make more funding available for all projects, including green projects. At the same time, Congress should increase the proportion of that new funding 
that's provided as additional subsidization. In other words, grants and principal forgiveness. Additional subsidization is a lifeline for project applicants that cannot afford to take out a traditional low interest loan. But green projects compete for subsidy with projects that serve disadvantaged communities, and there isn't enough to go around. Another barrier to the green project reserve is the fact that many pro potential project applicants simply aren't aware that it exists, while others lack the expertise to complete the application material. Congress can reduce this obstacle by providing the states with more resources for outreach and technical assistance. Of course, the Green Project Reserve isn't the only mechanism available to promote sustainable water infrastructure. Congress should set up new grant programs to diversify funding options for water resiliency efforts, and it should require climate change information to be considered in the planning of all clean water infrastructure projects as a condition of providing federal assistance. Last but certainly not least, Congress should establish a permanent low-income water and sewer assistance program and adopt other reforms to improve water affordability. This would allow utilities to implement resilience projects and other upgrades without imposing burdens on their low-income customers. I would be happy to discuss any of these recommendations in more detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Perry. Uh, we uh, will now uh, proceed with the member of questions. Uh, we want to thank all our witnesses for all the testimony and the questions that will arise, we will use the timer to allow five minutes for each question from each member. If there are additional questions, we may have additional rounds as necessary and as time permits. And I will recognize Mr. DeFacio for the first uh, round of questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to uh, Ms. Hammer, who just uh, uh, testified to this, and, and Mr. Perry uh, also, um, do you believe that we need a codified uh, and explicit, and I think you've already answered this, but I want to get it fully on the record, a program for, for Green Reserve? Uh, and why would it have to be a separate program? Wouldn't states just utilize the SRF money uh, to implement these sorts of programs? The Senate bill totally omits uh, the uh, Green Reserve. So uh, if each of you can answer that question, why it, it needs to be codified, it'd be great. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you for that question. Um, so uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, um, the fact that the Green Project Reserve is not codified in statute has generated significant uncertainty amongst potential um, applicants who would be ac accessing those funds to carry out projects. Um, and that depresses long-term demand for funding. So if we put it into the statute, it will become a more reliable source of funding. Um, and part of the issue is that it takes a while to plan these projects. So if we're talking about a source of funding that may be available this year or maybe not, depending on what the Appropriations Committee puts into their bill that year, um, if I'm someone who's thinking of carrying out a green infrastructure project, I might not you know, be able to depend that that money is going to be there in five years, um, you know, when I need it. And I think as, you know, as history shows, before the Green Project Reserve was adopted in 2009, um, when it's not there, these projects don't, don't tend to get funded because the resources aren't available. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Perry, do you want to Absolutely. Uh, I, I definitely agree with uh, Ms. Hammer. Um, I'm actually probably more well-versed in the design aspects rather than, than policy, but I can say from one perspective that I know that a lot of municipalities um, are really counting for you know, a solid um, piece of funding to not only go through design and implementation, but it's really the maintenance end where you see a lot of um, communities very very nervous about implementing green infrastructure at the wide wide scale and so being able to again have a um uh, a solid chunk of funding that's there and it's permanent is i think critical for local communities to accept more widely green infrastructure approaches okay thank you and to uh, ms powell and uh, mr parante if we have time uh, you know these uh, innovative technologies uh, that you've put in place, uh, were these uh, good, hard business decisions? I mean, these have penciled out, save the ratepayers money uh, in the long term and uh, will be amortized in a relatively short period of time? 
Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. DeFazio. Yes, and, and our team uh, looks at the, the cost benefit as well as other measures uh, when we're making decisions about projects that we will implement. Uh, so, uh, for instance, when we look at the implementation of solar projects and when we look at the implementation of, of thermal hydrolysis, um, we, we, uh, the team looked at how much that would uh, ultimately save uh, our, our ratepayers in terms of operating costs that we could then reinvest in other critical infrastructure investments. Good. So, uh, and uh, to uh, Ms. Ferrante, same question. Uh, the real solid business case for these sorts of projects that pencils out in favor of the ratepayers. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, uh, Chair DeFazio, uh, especially I, I can talk about the, uh, for example, the food waste recycling project uh, definitely pencils out uh, with respect to uh, allowing our uh, main wastewater treatment plant not only to be energy self-sufficient to avoid, uh, you know, having to pay the utility for all the power, but allowing us to export to the grid to generate revenue from that way and also to cost effectively generate, convert that gas into vehicle fuel and allow uh, not only our vehicles, other uh, government vehicles to be fueled by it, but it's also open to the public. So passing on that benefit to the public and it's charged at the same uh, rate as uh, conventional natural gas. So it does pencil out for us and the savings uh, are passed on to uh, our ratepayers. Thank Just you. a quick question and my time will have expired, but I, I assume the end product is a sort of a composted material. What do you do with that? So, so we have uh, the actual solids that are digested. It is a comp it's a material. We partner with private composters uh, that take the material. They comp uh, compost it with agricultural waste in most cases, and then they market that product and it is used as a soil amendment. Uh, for agricultural fields, uh, and also some of it is actually sold uh, to the general public as well, but it is a product that is usable, and it, it displaces chemical fertilizers in terms of being used in agricultural fields. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My time has expired. Mr. Rouser, you're next. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, really enjoyed uh, listening to the uh, testimony of all of our witnesses, and uh, this has been a, a hinted at or alluded to uh, uh, previously, but I think the fundamental question is, you know, how do we make these infrastructure improvements and get the, and get the best value for the uh, taxpayer and uh, the ratepayer? Uh, in fact, that's really the fundamental question for all things that uh, Congress considers. Uh, Mr. Colson, I, I know you um, obviously uh, uh, have great experience in this arena, and I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about uh, uh, what's taking place in North Carolina as far as promoting sustainability and resiliency. Uh, we have uh, uh, some pretty good-sized cities in North Carolina, and we have some very small towns, as you alluded to in, in your testimony. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about what North Carolina is doing. Thank you for that question. Um, in 2017, North Carolina developed a master plan to meet our water infrastructure needs. And it's not just funding goals, it's developing organizational capacity, developing financial capacity in our utilities, and that will lead to sustainable infrastructure and infrastructure management. Um, part of that focus is also focusing on our small communities across the state. We've identified over 100 utilities that are really struggling financially with their water and sewer systems. And we've made a concerted effort to help those utilities become viable utilities because that's so important in meeting their sustainability. And we've also been focusing on changing our priority system as a result of our hurricanes that we've had and trying to move some of the infrastructure out of the floodplains and making it more flood resilient as well. Of course, this changed uh, significantly from 2007 when we were funding a lot of reclaimed water because at that point we were in a drought. And of course, that's part of the, ch the benefit of the SRFs. We have that flexibility to adapt to these changing needs in our communities. 
With all those small, uh, small towns, uh, can you talk a little bit about how, uh, particularly any specific cases that come to mind where federal mandates create additional uh, cost, uh, complexity uh, that uh, really is unnecessary in terms of achieving the end goal? Thank you for that question. Um, all federal mandates require paperwork to document that you're meeting the mandate. And of course, for some of our projects, particularly in our small communities, if they have a gravity sewer system that simply needs to be replaced because it's broken, they have to fix it. The question is, do they have to document water efficiency and energy efficiency in a project and infrastructure that uses no energy? So that's an example of where uh, the paperwork and the goal don't really quite match what's going on in the small communities. Obviously, there's a, uh, a strong incentive, um, I think, among you know, most to move to green energy uh, practices. Uh, you know, perhaps 10 years ago, 15 years ago, certainly 20 years ago, uh, you could make, a, uh, I think, a much stronger case uh, uh, for mandates if you, if you want to look at it from that perspective. Uh, but today, uh, a lot of people are naturally moving, trying to move that way anyhow. You want to comment on that a bit and your observations, what you're seeing around the state and elsewhere? Sure. Um, recently, we have funded several um, energy type projects at some of our urban areas. For example, the city of Raleigh. Um, they recently did a similar project that Mr. Ferrante um, described where they changed their digesters from aerobic to aero anaerobic, generated methane. Their particular case, um, they had a natural gas pipeline on their property. They came to an agreement with the natural gas company. They put the methane into the natural gas line, drew it back out in downtown Raleigh to power their bus fleet. And so that specific case study was developed at the local level and the business case made sense. And we put 50 million into that project. Um, so that was a project where we far exceeded our green project reserve requirement. One of the issues with the green project reserve is the next year we didn't have any projects that we closed on, so we didn't meet it, but we didn't get any credit for carryover from that significant investment from the year before. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I note that my time has almost expired, so I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Roser. I will begin the questioning from my side, and this is directed to Mr. Ferranti, uh, because there are many water agencies across the country and the globe developing water recycling projects, and your agency is rare for having 60 years of experience in water recycling. How has the recycling changed over the years, and how do you see this important water supply opportunity growing in the future. How are water agencies across the globe sharing information on water recycling? Thank you. Thank you for that question, uh, Chair Napolitano. Uh, yeah, you, you know, I'll answer the first part first. Um, with respect to uh, water recycling, over the last 50 to 60 years, we've seen a, a, a fundamental greater understanding uh, from the public with respect to water recycling. I think a big part of that is that we couldn't do these programs without public outreach, without not only uh, tours of the facility so people understand and can um, uh, have confidence in the treatment of the water that they're seeing, but also programs in schools for uh, kids to learn about water recycling and the benefits of it to the environment. Those have been key things. And obviously we've seen, especially over the last 20 to 30 years, a strong demand and increase in uh, water recycling. And um, what's interesting is we've also seen the success of water conservation, especially over the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, and actually our flows have dropped about 20 to 25% over the last 15 years. So it shows that the public is really understanding uh, when you allow them to under, under, to give them the information, they understand water issues. One other thing that we're having to do is balance water recycling with habitat protection as well. 
We need to maintain the habitats in our local rivers and creeks, and we can't just take all that recycled water and reuse it without maintaining that habitat. For the future, I see continued partnerships. I talked about the MET uh, uh, project, and that is our main partner, but we are partnering with all of our local cities, groundwater basins, LA County Public Works out here, and more and more, I'm having discussions as a wastewater agency with water purveyors and uh, stormwater uh, stormwater entities too, that that we really are looking at water in a complete sense. And obviously, the drought that's occurring in California is making a big impact on uh, water. Uh, water resiliency and I think water recycling needs to be in the, in these stressed areas a core component of uh, the portfolio specifically so that you can bank water in good times and then use that water when the drought really hits and you don't get your allocations. Thank you for that. I know that we used to say the um, recycled water it was toilet to tap and we changed it to showers to flowers and there is no more landfill new landfill in LA County the city has 4 million and the county has 12 million. So it's a lot of people to uh, recycle water. Can you discuss the biodigesting program and how do you recycle food waste? Yeah, I can expand a little bit on that. That really started as a partnership and demonstration between us as a wastewater treatment agency and a solid waste agency with local private solid waste haulers that are collecting from cities. They have franchise uh, agreements with the cities to pick up their waste. And also here in California, um, there's a uh, regulation moving towards diversion of organics from landfills. So these municipalities have to comply with this requirement in terms of diverting up to 75% of the organic waste from landfills. And wastewater treatment plants as um, as uh, Mr. Colson mentioned and others mentioned, we have anaerobic digesters and we have excess capacity often that can be utilized. We have that infrastructure in place that can be utilized to take additional organic material. And food waste in particular is high in energy. It, it really translates into producing a great deal of digester gas that can be used beneficially. And as I mentioned, we use it in a variety of ways, not only in our existing power plant, it makes uh, over 20 megawatts of energy, making our largest uh, wastewater treatment plant completely energy self-sufficient. We sell some excess power into the grid and we still have more to convert into pure natural gas, essentially renewable natural gas for vehicle fuel. So that's the program kind of in a nutshell. Thank you very much. I had a question for Ms. Hammer, but I'll submit it in writing because my time is up. Mr. Babin, you're next. You may proceed. Mr. Babin? He's not here. All right, Mr. Garamendi, you may proceed. Mr. Garamendi. Mr. Garrett Graves. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I have to commend the, the rhyming that you had going on in your line of questioning. Uh, if uh, you evaluate your next career, perhaps a poet or even a, a rapper would be, um, <laughs> would be a good path for you. Nice to see you. Um, I, I wanna thank all the witnesses today. It's, it's been very, very informative. And, and obviously with all the recent discussion on infrastructure, this is, this is a very important time for us to be uh, very thoughtful about the federal government's role in infrastructure, how to improve the project development delivery process, uh, how to properly prioritize projects, and of course, there's always this discussion on balance of utilization of green versus gray, um, how to use the the, the, the best tool in the toolbox most effectively to, to achieve the best outcome. One of the, the questions that I've, I've asked myself a lot over the past few weeks is, is, is what I stated. What is the federal government's role in infrastructure? And certainly in this committee, you can make an excellent case 
for the federal government has a role in interstates. It has a role in the national highway system. It has a role in dealing with waterways that traverse various states and serve as major navigation channels for international commerce. Um, when you get beyond there, the question starts getting a little bit more challenging. Um, one of the things about the federal government's role in highways or interstates, for example, is that there's a user fee mechanism. You, you go and you pay a tax for every gallon of gas you buy. The more gas you burn uh, because you have an inefficient vehicle, you drive more miles, uh, the, more, the more of a user fee you pay. In the case of water systems, there's a similar user fee mechanism, uh, but that is collected entirely at the local level. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious, and please don't, this isn't a, an attack on you, but, but I am just curious at your response, uh, both the DC and uh, the LA systems. Uh, give me your pitch as to why this is a, a federal responsibility uh, for us to jump in and, and pay this whenever you have a user fee mechanism uh, in place. Uh, maybe, maybe Ms. Powell, we'll start with you. Yes, thank, and thank you for the question. Um, I, we believe that um, one way for the federal government to partner with, uh, with, with localities and, and local utilities is to increase the amount of funding for, for water infrastructure. Um, because it is infrastructure, it supports the built environment and it supports essential services in every community. Uh, and I think that someone said that no community can be without it. Um, obviously, we're here in DC and it can be seen as, as a national security issue if you don't have safe, clean drinking water and wastewater services because of the customers that we provide services to. Um, and I think that, um, you know, again, the, the federal government providing the levels of funding that is consistent with other mode, other, other infrastructure sectors um, is, is a start. Um, for us in DC, we believe that there uh, should be a, a, a federal fair share contributed to uh, the infrastructure that was uh, turned over to the district to manage. Uh, which was uh, undersized when it was turned over to, to the district. And that is something that we will be uh, looking into more. Uh, and then the last way I would say is to implement the, uh, uh, in a sustainable way, a low income water assistance program. Uh, as Ms. Hammer said, it's important for everyone to have access to safe, clean drinking water. Uh, and there are many that cannot afford it. There are some states that don't have enabling legislation for customer assistance programs. And we have a number of projects that we have to implement um, to uh, be in compliance with federal regulation. So it's important to, to make sure that we have funding to implement those projects without over. Thank you. I, I want to make sure we have time for Mr. Fronte to answer as well. I, I just I want to make note. I, I believe that Washington has one of the lowest rates in the in the nation in, in regard to water rates, and and I, I'm just not sure I understand this divorce between user fees and and federal government investment. Um, Mr. Fronte, I just have a, about 30 seconds left. But do you care to answer? Sure. And perhaps uh, more specifically, so why should people in Louisiana and Arkansas pay for LA's water system? Sure. Uh, the, the issues we're facing uh, with respect to drought uh, covers more than just California. It covers, you know, uh, the southwestern United States. So it's an, really an interstate issue. And obviously, with greenhouse gas emissions, the reductions that can occur in California benefit not only to the people uh, on the East Coast and Louisiana, but across the world. So it is really uh, a, a big, it's a global issue. It's a national issue at a minimum. So the reductions that we can achieve here and the, the reductions that they can achieve benefit us as well. And that's why uh, I think we could use user fees, but we, we want to use these money in an equal way, in a uniform way across the country attacking global issues or interstate issues, especially with respect to water and climate change. Thank, thank you both for your, for your answers. Madam Chair, uh, I want to thank you. I just think we need to be very thoughtful as we move forward at, at, at losing this alignment between ratepayers and infrastructure because I think that you have incentives aligned. When you start divorcing it, there's no longer an incentive for people to be efficient with water usage and things like that. So I think as we move forward, uh, think about that. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Grace, uh, 
it is interesting that you say that because California has always been a donor state in many areas. So I uh, kind of take exception to that. Uh, Mr. Garamendi, you're on, you may proceed. Mr. Garamendi. I have to find the right microphone here, thank you. Uh, Mr. Graves, uh, you are at the outfall of the nation's largest sanitation system, otherwise known as the Mississippi River. I'm sure that you would want to have the upstream users delivering clean water into that system. Uh, with regard to uh, the uh, issues, this is a question for Mr. Ferrate and uh, Miss um, Powell. Uh, the testimony thus far has indicated that these are very complex systems, takes a long time to engineer and to build. The current uh, NEPI's program is for a five-year authorization, uh, at which time uh, the project is neith neither completed or probably even started. So I've introduced uh, H.R. 1881, which would provide for a 10-year permit rather than a five-year permit. Uh, so, Mr. Ferrate, is this uh, useful to you in getting your projects built? And the same question for Ms. Powell. Thank you for that question, uh, Representative uh, Garamendi. Yeah, the concept of providing uh, the state with authority to issue a permit, the, not only the authority, but the flexibility to issue a permit longer than five years, but not more than 10 years. Joe, is Westerman is next. Is, is something that makes sense. Um, our current system of permitting fails to recognize the life cycles of technologies. As I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the project that we're uh, involved in with Metropolitan has been in the planning phase for 10 years. Construction will take up to six to seven years. We're looking at the early uh, 2030s. They're uh, very complex. But uh, I do want to emphasize uh, that extending the state's authority would not preclude revisions to a permit if uh, new and important information uh, were to be revealed impacting water quality standards. And I think that's important. We wanna ensure the continued confidence of the and trust from the public that we serve that the proper level of oversight is being provided, especially as we embark on new advanced technologies and new recycled water treatment systems. Thank you, Ms. Powell. Would you like to add or just uh, say that uh, it's a great idea to have 10 years rather than five years? Um, Representative Garamondi, we, we support any tool or approach that allows for flexibility in meeting uh, what are complex requirements and our permits um, as we work to implement uh, the necessary improvements that are more expensive and more time intensive to implement. Thank you. Uh, we'll continue to pursue uh, 1881 and perhaps find it in additional legislation. I want to go back to Mr. Ferrate and the discussions that you've had. First of all, a big shout out to what you've been able to accomplish. Uh, indeed, California is in the midst of another drought, and uh, I've often said that the fifth biggest river on the west coast of the Western Hemisphere are the sanitation plants in Southern California. Uh, probably a million acre feet of uh, water can be secured for Southern California with complete uh, utilization of recycling. And the efforts made by the Sanitation District and Metropolitan Water System is extraordinarily important to California as it is to other uh, Western states and probably states in the East such as uh, Georgia that also has periodic droughts and problems. And so I want to just raise the issue that the uh, programs that were authorizing in this legislation must and should include recycling as well as the capture of methane uh, and gases uh, from the uh, sanitation facilities. Uh, so I, the uh, other piece of this uh, for Southern California is that uh, there's a place to put the water, the recycled water, and that is in the uh, underground aquifers of Southern California, which taken together have a larger capacity than the uh, largest reservoir, Shasta. Uh, Ms. Ferrate, would you care to take a few moments to further comment? And also, if you would pick up uh, the chairman, the chairwoman's um, long-held view that uh, Title 16 of the uh, uh, Reclamation Act uh, provides money for recycling. 
Yeah, th thank you for the opportunity to comment on this. I think, you know, you've correctly pointed out uh, with respect to uh, drought, especially in Southern California, and, you know, people are starting to use the terms mega drought and permanent drought uh, for the um, way of looking at our current situation. That recycled water, it's it's got to be part of the core portfolio for uh, the water systems here, probably throughout the Southwest uh, California. And specifically, it can be used, uh, as you mentioned, with uh, groundwater replenishment in order to be able to, I use the term bank, or replenish those groundwater supplies during good years when you have a little bit of excess. And then when you have those years, such as uh, what we're potentially facing this year and in the next few years, where you're not going to get the allotments, especially for Southern California, whether they, uh, you know, be in the imported water. And I know some of the our neighbor states are facing the issues with the Colorado. When you don't get those allotments, then you can take that groundwater out and hopefully make you resilient. In our case, um, I mentioned earlier, you mentioned the Metropolitan Project we're working on that could supply 10% of the uh, water need that Metropolitan usually provides. So that is a big part of it. Um, switching gears, you mentioned the methane. The methane- I'm sorry. The I, time I, is up, so would you wrap you, it up, please? Mr. Ferrati, uh, thank you very much. I really look forward to working with you and with the chairwoman on the other piece of it, which is Title 16, uh, which provides, does provide money for reclamation. My final point is that it was Richard Nixon that decided that the federal government had a role in cleaning up our sanitation systems. So, with that, I... Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garamendi. Uh, well, I'm uh, asking on a bill to increase Title 16 to 500 million. That's how serious I am about it. Uh, Mr. Westerman, you may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to the ranking member. And, and Madam Chair, I just want to say again, thank you for... Uh, uh, what a pr privilege it was to work with you in the last Congress as ranking uh, member on this subcommittee and to be able to do the good work we did with WERDA and other uh, issues. And I appreciate your continued uh, efforts on this uh, subcommittee. And Madam Chair, if you remember, yeah, I talked to you about a project going on in my district that we were going to try to go see, but COVID interrupted that. But we've got a... Uh, uh, agriculture water utility in my district that takes nutrient-laden water from the Arkansas River. Uh, they formed a, a crop irrigation district, and to participate in that, uh, farmers uh, stopped pumping water out of the Sparta Aquifer, which is high-quality drinking water that serves six different states out of that aquifer, and they used the groundwater, which the crops actually uh, act as a, uh, a filter that cleans the water, takes the nutrients out, and releases clean water back into the Arkansas River, which eventually gets down to Representative Graves District and the Mississippi River. And we know we've got issues with nutrient-laden water down there. So it's a real winner of a project. And I know, uh, Mr. Colson, in your written testimony, you talked about an Orange County, California project that was conserving groundwater. And my question to you is, would you agree that this type of innovative uh, utility project um, that EPA states, should, should this type of project be funded through SRF funding, regardless of whether public or privately uh, owned? Thank you for that question. Um, it's important to note that many of these projects are case specific to the locality to meet a specific need and utilities at the local level are developing the business case for these projects. And SRFs need to be flexible to meet these local needs. And that's what we're really focused on. Yeah, to me, it seemed like since it's accomplishing the purpose of, of cleaning water and conserving groundwater, it would be a great project for SRF funding. And, and Mr. Colson, while I'm talking to you, uh, the methane you were talking about coming uh, or capturing that, how do you transport it? In that particular case, there was a natural gas pipeline that was already on the wastewater treatment plant property. And that pipeline went up through into downtown Raleigh. So there was a transportation mechanism already there 
that the utility was able to utilize. And of course, of course that really helped the business case for the utility to implement that type project. It was another instance of how a pipeline actually helps with the environment in a safe, uh, efficient transport of a, of a biogas there. And back to the idea of SRF, I wanna just open this up for any of the witnesses um, and ask if you know uh, if any private entities are, are eligible for funding under the Clean Water State Revolving Fund in the case of addressing, addressing source pollution uh, and integrated watershed management. Uh, actually, um, they are eligible for that funding, but what can Congress do to encourage more private sector action to protect critically designated groundwater aquifers and reduce nutrients uh, like the project I was talking about where they, they enter the Mississippi River Basin? And uh, maybe also, what about state-based nutrient trading programs? And I believe North Carolina has one of those. That is correct. North Carolina does have a nutrient trading program and it's utilized by many of our municipalities to help protect our estuaries. Would any other panelists like to address that? Well, I'm running short on time. So I've uh, actually was in a hearing this morning on the Natural Resources Committee with the Indigenous Peoples Subcommittee. I heard a testimony there, a witness answered a, a question by Mr. Young, and I actually, when it was my turn to ask questions, I went back and had the witness restate the answer because it was just so shocking. But she stated that um, up in Alaska, in this one particular area, that the utility connection fee is $350,000 to $700,000 per home. And, and asking her to explain that in more detail, she said a lot of it is, is the regulatory process that has to be gone through uh, to actually build these projects and, and connect them, which um, you know, uh, I'm a professional engineer. I know we've got other engineers on the uh, Zoom today. That cost is almost unbelievable, but the witness stated that is the actual cost. Are, are there things we can do to relieve the regulatory burden so that we can build out these much needed water infrastructure projects uh, and do it with common sense and at a much lower cost? You, your time is up, Mr. Westerman. Well, if anybody would like to submit a uh, answer to the record, I would much appreciate that. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Malinowski, you may proceed. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thanks to the witnesses. Uh, I, um, like, like many uh, other parts of the country, my, my district in New Jersey has been affected in recent years by harmful uh, algal blooms. Uh, we've seen them uh, in uh, a couple of lakes in Morris County, Lake Hopatcong, Bud Lake, uh, a bunch of smaller ponds. We expect they're gonna reemerge this summer. Um, they forced, in some cases, the temporary closure of lakes and ponds to uh, recreation, to swimming, to boating, put an added strain on local economies that are dependent, um, uh, particularly in the summer on, on those uh, activities. And, and of course, toxins from HABs can also uh, harm uh, drinking water treatment, uh, also contaminate drinking water uh, treatment facilities, as I'm sure you are all, uh, all aware. Um, the most recent word of bill that was signed into law- uh, Is Mr. Mass created, returned? Created a, a demonstration program to detect, prevent, treat, and eliminate these HABs um, associated with water resources development projects, uh, and New Jersey was designated as a focus area for the program, which is good news for us, but there's a lot more work to be done. Um, we know that both wastewater discharge uh, and climate change are contributing factors, um, and we're working to address both of those in this um, committee. Um, Ms. Hammer, I, I, I wanted to see if you might be willing to address this question uh, and let us know what are some of NRDC's recommendations to Congress on how best to address uh, the problem, what strategies should be adopted at um, the state and local level uh, to treat 
uh, outbreaks? Um, are there any research gaps that still need to be closed? What, what more can we do? Thanks for the question. Um, so we know that nutrient pollution is the primary driver of harmful algal blooms. Um, and that nutrients come from both agricultural sources like animal manure and fertilizers, as well as urban runoff, um, sewer system discharges, wastewater treatment facility discharges. Um, NRDC actually has a website dedicated to this issue that tracks how well states are monitoring algal blooms um, and you know, reports that um, information to the public. So I would encourage um, anyone to, to check that out who is interested in how they're state and local government are managing this issue. Um, as you said, we also know that, you know, climate change makes algal blooms worse between you know, rising temperatures, more intense precipitation. Um, in terms of solutions, you know, a lot of the things we're talking about today, um, green infrastructure can be a really important tool in reducing nutrient runoff from the urban environment. So can wetlands preservation, um, ensuring that wetlands are fully protected by the Clean Water Act, since wetlands can filter out the kinds of nutrients that cause algal blooms, um, as well as water conservation, um, making sure we're not withdrawing too much water from water bodies because then they get stagnant. Um, that's one condition in which algal blooms can occur. Um, you know, Congress can help with all this by increasing funding for water infrastructure, um, especially green projects, so that communities can implement projects that, um, that reduce nutrient pollution. Great, thank you. So switching gears a bit, um, we, we all know that um, foreign adversaries of the United States use cyber operations uh, to try to damage physical and digital infrastructure in our country. And earlier this year, as uh, I know you're all aware, a water treatment plant in Oldsmar, Florida was hacked. Um, and the intruders attempted to dramatically increase the amount of sodium hydroxide in the water treatment process. It was a near miss that could have proved uh, catastrophic. Um, a lot of experts have testified to us to this, former CISA director, uh, Chris Krebs, uh, cybersecurity experts from the FBI and, and other agencies. Um, every state has been a target to some degree in New Jersey. Uh, our statewide IT system faces actually millions of attempted cyber attacks every single day, according to our uh, state office of Homeland Security and preparedness. So I, I maybe pose this to some of the state and local representatives and, and, and ask you all, um, how are you working to secure your systems against intrusions? Um, do you have the personnel and resources you need? Uh, anything else that you would want to share with us in terms of how the federal government um, can do more to help? Uh, Representative Malinowski, this is Keisha Powell, if I may. Um, DC Water, uh, and, and you know, we uh, certainly looked at the incident in, in Florida and, and did uh, a, another assessment on, on our systems we're continuously monitoring. Uh, we do, we are fortunate enough to have secure uh, cybersecurity personnel uh, that are constantly monitoring our systems. Uh, w which are critical systems um, in, in our uh, distribution system and wastewater treatment process, that also takes additional funding to maintain that infrastructure and to make, su make sure that we're resilient against any potential attacks. Um, as the former commissioner of the city of Atlanta's Department of Watershed Management had to live through uh, managing that system um, through the attack in early 2018 that the city of Atlanta experienced. Um, so I, I would say that this is a, a very critical issue for all water wastewater systems um, that certainly need to have the appropriate funding uh, to make sure that we can not only um, hire the right people, but also have the right systems and security measures in place. Mr. Malinowski, your time is up, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Ms. Powell. We go on to Mr. Mast, you may proceed. Thank you, ma'am, uh, Madam Chairwoman. I appreciate it. Uh, this has been spoken about at length. I wanna just reiterate the need to update the, the, the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. Um, so important uh, for so many different states. 
uh, across uh, across the country. Um, it's been spoken about in length, and uh, I just want to reiterate my support for that as well. I know we had a hearing back in February, I want to say, on uh, where we spoke quite a bit about this issue as well. Um, I want to speak a little bit about leadership for our country at this point. And as we talk about water management and our federal agencies, let's talk about this a little bit at 30,000 feet. If I were to ask any of you as our witnesses uh, to complete this sentence, could you complete it for me? Lead by... Go ahead. Lead by example. Lead by example. Anybody disagree with that? No. You think you would all complete that sentence in that way? Lead by example. And here's where I'm going with this. As the federal government looks at water management, whether it's wastewater or whether it's algal blooms or anything else, we have these siloed federal agencies like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers or the EPA or others. And we'll have the EPA make statements and determinations and conduct studies that our own federal agencies won't adhere to. That's a major problem. That is not leading by example. That is not, that's an example of the left hand not talking to the right hand. And, and as I look at that as a situation, if we're going to have the, the EPA and put all this, these resources and, and let the EPA go out there and say, this needs to happen in this way, uh, we do not recommend you state that you do this, or you person with a farm or a ranch that you do this, or you person with a business that you do this, how in God's name do we allow other federal agencies to do what one of the other federal agencies is telling everybody else not to do. I don't, I don't really know why that is allowed to occur, but I would love to give you, our witnesses, a chance to sound off a little bit on, on that as a statement. You know, I agree, I disagree pound sand, whatever, you know, but if you'd like to sound off on that, I would love to hear it and have a little discussion on that. Unmute, please. Thank you. Howard Newcraft from the Water Center at Penn, and, uh, you know, we're dealing with these issues everywhere, and uh, you're absolutely right about the, the siloed activities that are going on at the agencies. And part of it is because the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act are siloed also, and they kind of created that kind of situation. Unfortunately, that, that siloing has gone down into the water utility. But when you look at this, when you, look, when you really look at this, it's, it's bigger than that, because we're, you're not just looking at siloing the, the, the issue of the day. Um, but you're really looking at a community. And you're trying to figure out what's best for this community. There's only so much money, and there's so many priorities, and they differ uh, from block to block and from neighborhood to neighborhood. And uh, I think the real secret here is, is how do we identify what the community needs, what their priorities are, and then how do we get the federal government agencies to assist those communities in what they need, whether it's a enforcement against an industry or whether it's some funding or whatever it may be. So I'd love to pause you right there. I think you said something extremely important. That has to be the goal of Congress. What does the community need? How are we of the people, by the people, for the people? And my time is running dry, but uh, I think the, the important part of, uh, of what you said there, one of the important parts of what you said there is uh, that I would read into in this way. No community needs the federal government to go out there and poison them. I don't know of one community across this country that says, yeah, I need the Corps of Engineers or some other arm of the federal government to come in and mess up a part of my community. And with that, I yield back, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Mast, uh, very much for your testimony and your question. Mr. Carvajal, you may proceed. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Ferranti, as part of America's Water Infrastructure Act of 2018, Congress established a drinking water system infrastructure, resiliency, and sustainability program at EPA. Uh, this was based on legislation I worked on called the Water Infrastructure Resilience and Sustainability Act, also known as WRSA. The program's purpose is to help small drinking water systems make their infrastructure resilient to natural hazards, including those associated with climate change and extreme weather. Do you believe it is important to also advance policies to ensure the nation's wastewater infrastructure is similarly prepared to withstand the effects of climate change and extreme weather? And what sort of resilience and adaptation challenges are you facing at your util utility? Thank you for that question. Uh, and, and thank you for your leadership on the issue. And to answer your question is absolutely uh, wastewater treatment plants and utilities uh, need to be included. Uh, we do have our uh, uh, own uh, unique challenges when it comes to climate change, uh, and uh, we're seeing a number of impacts. Um, I think some of the other speakers before talked about infiltration and inflow into sewer systems that occurs during rainfall events. And what we're seeing here, and even in Southern California, we're seeing less rain, but when it rains, it rains very powerfully, uh, very locally and can inundate uh, sewer systems. Um, and we've had uh, also, even though our overall flow is down, uh, as I mentioned before, because of water conservation, we're seeing some of these big storms can uh, really uh, tax our whole system. Uh, and that's one reason why we've really had to uh, look at our overall capacity as well. So there's a number of issues there. And then, of course, uh, we all know the number of people that live in coastal communities around, uh, not only in California, but around the country. And uh, those areas are not only seeing, you know, potentially the effects of sea level rise, but storm surges are becoming more and more significant. And when you now uh, couple a flooding event, uh, flooding a sewage pumping plant that's along the coast, now you've really uh, created a bad problem and made it worse when you've mixed in, uh, unfortunately, wastewater. So there's a number of acti activities. We, we have started looking and doing our own assessments at our treatment plants. We're gonna try and do our complete system uh, here in the next uh, couple of years in terms of what we have to do. But uh, by all means, if there could be a incentive and uh, funding for wastewater utilities to do that, as for, especially the smaller ones that don't have the expertise in-house to do it, that would be, that would be very helpful because obviously uh, uh, now these systems are so integrated too when you talk about recycled water that it's not just a wastewater. It, it could be something that is a new supply and a recycled water and leads to drinking water. So there Thank you, Mr. Ferranti. I'm trying to get in a second question. Uh, Ms. Hammer, I represent a coastal district in California, and we have seen our fair share of extreme weather events due to climate change. Apart from addressing the climate crisis, what steps should wastewater systems be taking steps to prepare their infrastructure and operation to withstand the effects of climate change and extreme weather? And two, can you discuss the importance of a standalone grant program for clean water resilience projects that you discussed in your testimony? Thanks for the question. Um, there's a lot that wastewater and stormwater utilities can, can be doing to build resilience to climate impacts. Um, you know, distributed green infrastructure throughout their service area is one way to um, reduce the amount of water that's entering the system, which can be incredibly helpful in combined sewer, uh, in combined sewer systems. Um, of course, that's not going to solve every problem that faces wastewater utilities. Um, a lot of wastewater treatment plants, as you know, are located in low-lying and coastal areas because that's where they need to discharge their effluent, and so those facilities are extremely vulnerable to sea level rise. There was um, a study recently that showed, you know, how many you know, many millions of Americans could lose wastewater treatment um, with 
you know, even a modest amount of sea level rise. So those facilities will need to consider longer term, you know, um, hardening their facilities or ideally relocating them to higher ground. Um, in terms of a grant program, you know, we strongly support um, the grant program that, that you have proposed that would um, enable uh, utilities to take some of these measures. So thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you very much. I ran out of time. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Carajal. Very much appreciated. Ms. Gonzalez Colon, you are next. You may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, thank you for holding uh, these continuous hearings a matter of so vital for health, safety, and future economic recovery of our communities. And I think wastewater management is an essential part and component in developing housing industry uh, without uh, which a community cannot survive and much less grow. In that sense, uh, extreme weather will impact wastewater infrastructure. Many of our treatment plants lie in flood risk areas and locations that will be at risk uh, because of the sea level rise. And these, of course, require that any infrastructure initiative consider there will be conditions in the future on how those natural disasters that are periodic may now uh, intensify. In that sense, that is why in our disaster relief bills in the past two Congresses, we included provisions to allow big, better processes. And this must be part of any program, since by building to improve standards, we can have an infrastructure that is more resilient and can handle emerging situations better. And again, resilient does not mean uh, that infrastructure is going to be indestructible. It's that we may recover fast about those uh, emergency situations. Just in the case of Puerto Rico, the, uh, the main water utility process and the aftermaths of the disaster of 2017 the wastewater infrastructure suffer over $618 million in immediate damages uh, under FEMA emergency categories. An additional $3.7 billion allocation for all water and wastewater operations has been announced by FEMA. Um, of course, securing those priorities uh, of the funding uh, for wastewater sector, especially for economical dis dis disadvantaged areas, uh, needs the attention of this committee and where the money is going to come from. Um, we must consider those communities that do not have the cash of the resources for matching or even in kind uh, in order to uh, benefit from any infrastructure rebuilding initiative. Um, I think it's important uh, that this committee have uh, the testimonies of representatives of EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers and other federal agencies that can actually oversee uh, in, important infrastructure. There's many, many funds that are being approved by FEMA, uh, by the Staff for Act in many instances, not just in hurricanes, earthquakes, uh, flooding areas uh, across the nation. How those federal agencies are managing with the local uh, communities and with the local governments in order to maximize the resources that are being approved uh, and not having the same mistakes uh, by investments that are not being resilient. So in that sense, I think the expertise of uh, people uh, of the panel, I just uh, can ask um, Mr. Colson, uh, Powell, what will you say are the specific areas within the wastewater uh, infrastructure that were increased federal participation that will make the greatest impact? I know we may not have the money for all. Which do you understand will, will make the big difference? Olson? This is Keisha. I'm sorry. Olson, uh, whoever in the panel, Powell, Ferrante? Yes, this is Keisha Powell. Um, I, I agree with everything that you said, and thank you for the question. Um, it is critically important that first we protect um, our, our wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, Blue Plains is the largest advanced wastewater treatment plant in, in the world. Uh, and we are taking measures to protect that facility uh, with, with a flood wall. We're making that investment with uh, support and grant funding from FEMA. Um, it's also important that we protect the pump stations and it's important that we invest in the sewers uh, that convey flows to the treatment plant and making sure that where, where possible, we're providing additional capacity in our sewers. Uh, much of 
the district's uh, sewer system is a combined system, uh, which happens to cover the most vulnerable communities in the district. Uh, and as I said, when we had a major flash flood event, uh, many more than 300 homes were impacted by sewer backups and surface flooding. Um, so it's important that we make the investments to improve our wastewater infrastructure so that we don't have continued impacts to vulnerable communities, which are more often, most often communities of color and those that can ill afford uh, the costs of cleanup and restoration. Thank you, Ms. Powell. Uh, I know my time has expired, so I will submit the rest of my questions to the record. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Gonzalez Colon. And uh, we will proceed with Mr. Stanton, followed with Mr. Lamualpa. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for holding this important hearing about the need for innovative investments to ensure our wastewater infrastructure is resilient against the impacts of climate change. The Southwest is rapidly changing and growing, and nowhere is it more evident than in my state of Arizona. In 2019, Arizona ranked third in population growth, with many of our communities growing significantly faster than the national average. We're also facing extended drought and extreme heat, and last summer was Arizona's hottest on record. These facts make our water needs both serious and urgent. To sustainably welcome and provide for the millions of people who call our region home, we must invest in our water infrastructure and secure our water future. And those investments need to be partnerships as well. Partnerships at the local, state, and federal level between urban, rural, and tribal communities. As the former mayor of Phoenix, I know firsthand that local leaders must be innovative when it comes to addressing our infrastructure and planning for our water future. And frankly, we can't afford the alternative. We know that the future of our residents and our economy depends on how well we anticipate, plan, and respond to our water-related challenges and the continuing impacts of climate change. In Phoenix, we have long recognized the need to adapt to climate change, and this has only become more urgent in the last 20 years as prolonged drought has taken a significant toll on the Colorado River, which supplies the city with nearly 40% of its water. As mayor, we established the Colorado River Resiliency Fund to set aside capital dollars specifically for investment in resiliency efforts along the Colorado River. This fund has not only ensured the city has the water supplies necessary to meet its growing needs, but that water will be available in uncertain times of drought and climate change. Arizona has also led the way in the use of reclaimed water. The city of Phoenix reclaims wastewater and uses artificial wetlands to improve its quality after it leaves the plant. The cities of Mesa and Chandler in my district, they partner with the Gila River Indian community to reclaim wastewater and deliver it to the tribe where it is used for non-food crop agriculture. For every five acre feet delivered, Mesa and Chandler receive four acre feet of Colorado River water that, can, that can be used to meet potable demands. The partnership has helped the Gila River Indian community access additional water, and at the same time, Mesa and Chandler benefit by converting reclaimed water into a potable supply. These investments are necessary but they are costly, especially for smaller communities that do not have the population base to support major investments at levels that are affordable. Local governments are doing their part, but now it is critical that here in the federal government, we do our part to support and incentivize water reuse and recycling projects through robust investment in the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. My first question is for Mr. Ferrante. How important is water reuse and recycling to ensuring our infrastructure is resilient and sustainable, particularly as we continue to experience prolonged drought in the Southwest and the Colorado River Basin? Thank you for that uh, uh, question. And I think I've mentioned it before, but I'll reiterate it. I think uh, the water recycling is a must as we move forward with respect to uh, being uh, resilient to climate change and the drought. You know, uh, the last uh, uh, drought here a few years ago 
uh, in Southern California took the groundwater basins to near record low levels. And that has significant impacts. Not only does it uh, eat up whatever, uh, you know, uh, supply or buffer you had against a prolonged uh, low period, but it increases pumping costs, makes pumping more difficult out of those groundwater basins too. That affects a whole population, uh, everybody across the board here. So water recycling uh, has to be a core endeavor. And I know, you know, all of these systems are intertwined too. Um, Southern California, as you're well aware, depends on the Colorado River as well, as well as the state aqueduct system here too. And uh, all the recycling that we can do here means uh, this region needs less of that water and allows more of the water to stay locally. So it is a must not only for our area, but also for the benefit of the overall Southwest region. Thank you so much. My time is up. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Tenton. And with that, we'll go to Mr. Katko, follow up Ms. Norton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is a very- Mr. Katko is next. I'm sorry, and Ms. Norton. That was Mr. Stanton, Mr. Katko is next. Mr. Katko available. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you to all witnesses for joining us today. Uh, given the focus of this discussion on improving the efficiency, adaptability, and resiliency of our water utilities, I would like to hear from the panel on how the deployment of smart water technologies can help achieve these goals. As we know, these tools can help utilize, help uh, utility operators rapidly identify inefficiencies, blockages, or potential water loss points across treatment collection and distribution systems. Additionally, expanding the deployment of innovative sensors can assist with the, radio, the proactive identification of environmental hazards, as well as resiliency and risk mitigation efforts focused on long-term vulnerabilities. Finally, these increased efficiencies and decreased costs on the provider side translate to real savings and more affordable water for ratepayers. Lastly, I introduce the ARPA H2O Act to expand federal investments in innovative water technologies. And I look forward to working with the committee to continue advancing these priorities this year. Uh, Mr. Newkrug, what successful use cases for smart water technologies have you observed in your research? Uh, well, thank you for that question. Um, uh, cer certainly we're looking at, uh, and, and it's being installed all over the US and the world right now, are uh, automatic uh, uh, metering systems that, uh, that give immediate response to the homeowners to let them know if they have a leaky toilet or there's too much water being used from that property. And you take that and you extend it out as you, as you indicated to new sensors that uh, can work in the uh, uh, distribution system to identify where leakage happens and stop that pretty pretty quickly. So you know just just from that area of the distribution system, you have an incredible ability to uh, re, uh, reduce costs, reduce water loss, um, and uh, improve improve the overall health of the water. You move further into the treatment plans, you can also see that uh, uh, there's a lot of major activity happening with digitization of, of how you take all the different information you have, all the big data there, where water utilities are collecting data on a minute-by-minute uh, -minute basis, and it's too much for anybody to be able to assess. You need some form of, of uh, uh, artificial intelligence or to, to take this data and put it down and, and, and make it so that you can, you can use this data properly. Um, uh, uh, as as things come up, and also to just have a record that things are going well. So those are those are a few examples of, of the smart water systems. I I love the, uh, the my, my favorite is uh, uh, these pictures that I have from uh, particularly from uh, uh, some of the Asian communities where they're using uh, floating floating solar cells um, and uh, how you're using this, and they they help protect the water supply because they prevent the evaporation of reservoirs. And, uh, and water quality, and also producing uh, the kind of electricity that, uh, that we all need. Well, th thank you very much. Mr. Colson, uh, have you observed similar use cases in your work with the Council of Infrastructure Financing Authorities? 
I have not personally um, worked with smart sensors. However, I know a lot of our utilities are using big data and artificial intelligence to analyze their situation. I think for a lot of our small systems, the challenge is conveying that information uh, down to the, the local community where a town manager is the town manager, but he's also the public works director. And that's a real challenge for them to understand the technology, but also take the risk of investing in that technology when there's uncertainty of uh, the technology and how long it will last. So what do we do, Mr. Colson, to try and uh, bridge that gap, uh, the, the educational knowledge gap on the local level? Because to me, that's critically important for, and you're exactly right, a lot of these people wear several different hats as part of being in a town and they can't understand it to a depth and extent that uh, folks like you and Mr. Newkirk and others can. So what do we do in that regard? I think that's why resource agencies are so important in uh, water infrastructure management and, and meeting our water infrastructure needs. Agencies like Rural Water Association, our environmental finance centers across the country, those are important aspects to helping the utilities and lifting them up so the utility as itself can be resilient so that the infrastructure they manage can be resilient. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I have many more questions, but my time is up, so I'll yield back. And Ms. Napolitano, as always, it's wonderful to see you, my friend. Thank you, my friend, and thank you for your questions. Uh, I will now uh, yield to Ms. Norton, followed by Mr. Lowenthal. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for this very important uh, hearing. Uh, and my question is for, my first question is for Ms. Powell. Your testimony, and I'm quoting you, climate change is all about water. It couldn't be more true. Uh, and again, I'm quoting you, water is life. So this is so important, and as is this uh, hearing focused on climate change. In your testimony, you mentioned that thermal energy uh, in DC sewers is unique to the district and yet is untapped, I guess, elsewhere. I wish you would elaborate on that. What are the advantage? What's the importance? Yes, ma'am, and thank you for uh, the question, Ms. Norton. Uh, thermal energy in, in DC water sewers is not, not unique to the district, but unique to DC water in the district. Um, as the single largest energy consumer in the District of Columbia, uh, we sit on quite, uh, we sit on a significant amount of green energy potential. Uh, we're currently doing combined heat and power generation at the Blue Plains uh, wastewater treatment plant. We have implemented a first phase of solar projects, which in turn helps to, uh, through the DC Solar for All, uh, program help reduce energy burden on vulnerable uh, households. Uh, and we're looking at additional phases of solar at Blue Plains as well as our other facilities. Uh, and as part of our energy opportunities focus, which uh, we reinvigorated at the start of the year, we're, we're looking at many projects uh, to, to utilize um, the thermal energy from our waste, from our sewers and our wastewater treatment process. The uh, headquarters building that I'm sitting in right now uh, is 100% is supplied by thermal energy from the pump station that our, our headquarters is wrapped around. And we've identified more than 200, I believe 200 megawatts of, of thermal energy that exists in our sewers. Should we be able to harness that and potentially use that uh, in other areas of the district. Well, what, what the district is doing is, is a, a terrific example for the rest of the country in this regard. I understand that ratepayers are currently paying 95% of the costs uh, associated with this new, with this energy. What are the most effective steps, steps, steps we in the Congress can take to reduce the burden on ordinary customers? I think um, the work that the, the committee is doing now, um, as, I, as I mentioned, the legislation uh, that is being considered to, to provide uh, close to 50 billion in funding uh, for wastewater, water and wastewater infrastructure um, is a start, but I think we definitely need to make sure that there is more grant funding 
we also need to make sure that there is a federal low income water assistance program, because even though DC's rates are are uh, moderately low, uh, they they are increasing, um, just as other utilities across the country. Every community has vulnerable households that still can't afford it. And we have to continue to make investments, even though the investments that we're making in DC are cost effective and we're using any savings that are generated from our investments to, to reinvest in other critical infrastructure, we have to be mindful that it presents a burden on local ratepayers. Well, thank you for that response. Ms. Hammer, you have noted, I think quite correctly, that frequent flooding and heavy precipitation events pose a threat to wastewater service. In your opinion, what are the ways that public water systems, like our own, for example, can prepare for these extreme weather events? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, and just, you know, anecdotally, um, we've seen so many extreme weather events just here in the DC area. Um, I live in Alexandria, Virginia, and we've had 300 year storms, I think, in the last year, um, which is causing a lot of um, wastewater infrastructure and stormwater infrastructure problems. Um, again, I would just emphasize the importance of uh, deploying more um, distributed green infrastructure that can soak up the water before it hits the sewer system in the first place. Um, it's incredibly you know, cost effective when you factor in the long term um, operations and maintenance compared to hard infrastructure. And it's also more scalable um, than hard infrastructure, which is really, you know, once you build it, it's locked in and it's not very adaptable to changing rainfall patterns. Thank you, Madam Chair. My time is virtually expired. Thank you, Ms. Norton. And right now I should go back to Mr. Lamalfa if he's available. Sorry, Mr. Lowenthal. Mr. Lamalfa. Mr. Lamalfa. I guess he's not on. Mr. Lowenthal, you're next. I am available and it's good to see you, Madam Chair. <laughs> And I want to thank you and all the witnesses for this uh, very, very interesting on um, wastewater, on building resiliency and sustainable wastewater infrastructure. And I also want to talk, thank especially uh, uh, Mr. Ferrante talking about the importance of the Clean Water State Revolving Fund for infrastructure and also the, the tremendous need uh, for water recycling. And I rep my district in Southern California is about half and half between LA County and Orange County and both counties, but I especially want to point out the leadership of Orange County in uh, wastewater recycling. They have done a phenomenal job. Uh, but I'm interested in the prevention side. We're asking, we're talking about the infrastructure, but but I'm I would like to know whether you're aware of what's getting into your uh, wastewater, what's getting into our entire water stream. And that's the global crisis of and the failure of our recycling systems. And that's the plastic pollution, which is a crisis throughout the world now and throughout our nation. You know that less than 8% of the products that, that we get are ever, are ever going into our recycling bin. And of that, only 3% actually gets put into new products. So the vast majority of our, of our plastic pollution, of our plastics end up uh, uh, in incinerators and in, in, out in the ocean, in, in, in our wastewater. Uh, and so I'm interested in what do, do you see this problem? And I have a bill. I work on the prevention side. How are we going to, you know, break free from plastic pollution? And how, instead of holding agencies like your agencies and counties and cities from doing recycling themselves, hold the producers accountable in terms of extended producer responsibility projects? That's what I'm working on. And I have a bill with Senator Merkley over in the Senate was called Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. 
The problems are is that the growth we, you know, as Senator Merkley keeps pointing out, we are ingesting from our water system or our food about a credit card's worth of plastic into our system a, a week. All of us. That's the average now. Studies are saying. Uh, a broken recycling system, microfibers from uh, uh, wet wipes are, ending, are going into our, our ending. They're not supposed to be flushed, but they end up in our waste system. They are being, uh, my, uh, plastics are breaking down into microplastics. They're all going into our water system and our wastewater system. Are you, I'm just asked the panelists, are you aware of this problem? Uh, and uh, uh, have you really begun to, is this an issue that, of concern for those dealing with wastewater? I'm talking about the prevention of this because I, I, I don't think that you should be the ones that are responsible for cleaning it up either. But I wanna understand how you're dealing with the issue of plastic and plastic pollution that's getting into our waste stream. I appreciate the question. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll try and answer it uh, first here. But yes, we are concerned about microplastic uh, uh, pollution. You know, uh, our agency as well as Orange County is part of the uh, Southern California Coastal Water Research Program, which conducts, conducts monitoring off the coast, off the uh, Southern California, the, it's called the BITE. And uh, one of the uh, assessments it, it has started doing is looking at plastic pollution uh, that uh, is in the ocean, in the sediments. And unfortunately, it is finding more and more of it uh, getting into uh, the, our oceans. So we are concerned about it. And uh, we are developing methods to be able to uh, monitor the microfibers that you discussed to see its fate through our treatment plants. For the most part, we have uh, filtration as our tertiary or towards the end of our plants. And that does a good job of removing um, uh, almost all of the microplastics. But it is an issue of concern. And we do definitely support um, the uh, you know, producer responsibility that you're talking about. Because when you look at these issues, uh, across emerging contaminants and other issues, source control is by far the best uh, and most efficient way to reduce a pollution. By the time it comes to us, it comes in you know, concentrations and mixed with other waste that make it very difficult to remove, whether it be microplastics or other things. So source control is, uh, and, and uh, source reduction uh, as with a producer uh, responsibility uh, uh, is 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 definitely the way to go, and I'll uh, let somebody somebody else uh, uh, expand on that. I'm sorry, Mr. Lowenthal, oh. you're out of time. Okay. For right. now, I'm out of time for now, but this issue you, is you, not going you can, away. You can put your questions in writing for for us, Thank please. You. And uh, uh, next, Mr. Huffman, you may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I hope you can hear me on my cell phone here. I had some technical difficulties, but this is a, a very important subject. I'm glad you convened this hearing. And uh, as we invest in wastewater infrastructure, uh, I think it's important that we do that uh, with an eye toward the 21st century, uh, making sure we build back better. That needs to include the challenges of climate change. And we know that wastewater infrastructure has to be ready for sea level rise, as well as stronger, more frequent storms, flooding, and drought. Uh, others have spoken to that. Um, the Bipartisan Water Quality and Job Creation Act, which I'm very proud to co-sponsor, uh, would help us. It would reauthorize the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and include many provisions to mitigate and respond to climate change. So I'd like to ask Ms. Hammer, uh, if I could start there, about uh, the success that we've seen with uh, green and nature-based infrastructure projects and helping manage stormwater, trapping pollutants before they can reach ecosystems like the San Francisco Bay. Uh, and if you could please describe how these green and nature-based infrastructure projects uh, support clean water, climate resilience, and how Congress can promote more of this. Thanks for the question. Um, green infrastructure, of course, is um, kind of a catch-all term for a whole bunch of different 
practices, but they all work in more or less the same way, which is that they mimic nature by capturing rainwater where it falls, um, infiltrating it to the ground, having it taken up by plants um, or capturing it for reuse, um, which reduces the amount of uh, runoff that's going into waterways um, and recharges groundwater supplies, addressing you know, a number of different climate impacts. And because so many of them use vegetation, they also store carbon and help um, you know, reduce the carbon impacts of climate change as well. Um, so the Green Project Reserve and the Clean Water State Revolving Fund is, you know, we've been talking about that a lot today. It's such an important source of funding, um, you know, despite the fact that it has made up a relatively small proportion of clean water SRF assistance to date. Um, I think we can do a lot better um, using that program to uh, incentivize those projects um, by making it permanent and also increasing the amount of additional subsidization that's available for those and other projects. Thank, thank you for bringing up the Green Reserve. And uh, I wanna ask uh, Mr. Nakrug about that as well. More and more utilities are getting involved in renewable energy, producing enough to, to manage their own operations, sometimes even uh, selling it, uh, the excess on the market. And in my district in Healdsburg, I recently toured a photovoltaic uh, project where a 25 million gallon wastewater pond uh, now contains 11,600 solar panels, not only producing enough clean energy uh, for the city of Healdsburg, not just the wastewater plant, but the city, um, but also providing algae control, uh, preventing algae from building up in that um, project. Can you speak a little bit to how this green reserve is an important way to support innovation in wastewater like what we're doing in Healdsburg? Oh, it's, it's, it's so incredibly important. It's, it's uh, uh, you know, essentially there's, we're prioritizing our environmental needs uh, because there's not enough money to do everything that we need to do. And having a green reserve is really incredibly important because it's, it's dealing with the innovation and the new types of systems that we want to put in place for the next 50, 100 years. Uh, this stuff has to last. And we, you know, we can't replace this every 10 years. And with, uh, with the uncertainty with climate, uh, you, know, you want to do things that are uh, a little bit more decentralized perhaps uh, and be able to, uh, uh, so that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. And, and just really simple examples here is uh, uh, this, you know, when you look at the wastewater plants and you look at the outfalls and you realize that all these plants are gonna have to be moved or maybe, you know, pumps added that are gonna have to run continuously so you can, so you can pump the wastewater higher than, you know, the effluent higher than the ocean. Uh, these, these are all serious concerns that um, are gonna take a lot of money and, a lot of uh, work together amongst uh, uh, everyone on this, every everyone on this uh, on this call, and uh, and other and many others in order for us to resolve that. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Uh, what am I speaking to, Mr. Huffman? It's very nice of you to come on, uh, Mr. Kahaley. You are next. You may proceed. Mr. Kahaley. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, wave on to the committee uh, hearing today on your agenda. I really appreciate that and giving me this opportunity. Um, you know, I'm here because this uh, is there's a major uh, issue in my district and in the state of Hawaii as it relates to water and clean water, uh, and that is our cesspools and our um, very disturbing state of our uh, water treatment facilities throughout the state of Hawaii. You know, I think Hawaii in, in many cases can be um, viewed as a best example of a developed nation which has, uh, or, or um, uh, one of the worst uh, sewage disposal and contamination problems that exist uh, that affect our fresh water supply, our streams and our nearshore environments. And I appreciate the testimony of um, the testifiers today it has a lot of great information here uh, for me uh, to take back to my district. You know, in Hawaii, Chair, we have about 88,000 
cesspools that still exist throughout the state, they discharge about 53 million gallons daily of raw untreated sewage into the, um, uh, the groundwater that ends up in our freshwater supply, our streams, our nearshore marine environments. Uh, we have um, AOCs from the EPA throughout uh, Hawaii. Um, we violate the Safe uh, Clean Drinking Water Act, the EPA's requirement to, um, um, uh, I guess, get rid of large capacity cesspools since 2005 that have been in existence in Hawaii. Um, and, and it's a dire situation that we have. So um, I'm here to learn about what we can do in Hawaii to address this. And my question uh, is to Ms. Hammer uh, in regarding um, your testimony. You know, there's a tremendous opportunity in this Congress to address America's infrastructure, uh, including the needs of our wastewater. As I just described, Hawaii has great wastewater needs, um, and we lead the, the country in the number of cesspools uh, that uh, exist throughout the Hawaiian Islands. In addition, we have wastewater treatment facilities that have not been maintained, and it's facing a crisis. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how in Hawaii we can address these problems, especially in rural communities like the second congressional district that do not have the ability to connect to sewer lines or where local geology um, like a shallow water table near uh, coastal areas, like you mentioned earlier, uh, make it difficult to upgrade? Thank you for the question. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, Hawaii is not the only place in this country where access to sanitation is um, a dire issue. We've also seen um, serious problems in tribal communities in the Southwest, as well as um, communities in the Black Belt of Alabama. Um, there are technical solutions that are um, being developed. Um, you know, I would refer you to the work of Catherine Flowers, who's a true champion on this issue. Um, in terms of policy solutions, um, you know, these are the kinds of problems that we see in rural areas, low-income areas that tech, you know, traditionally do not have the rate base um, to take out a traditional clean water SRF loan that they would then have to repay. Um, there's, it's very difficult for them for many reasons, which is one reason why it's so important to bring more additional subsidization and grants into the SRF program um, so that we don't have a two-tier sanitation system in this country where wealthy communities have functional infrastructure and small rural disadvantaged communities, you know, have, have cesspools that are failing. Um, so that would be my, you know, my primary um, recommendation is to make sure that, um, that more grant funding is available. Thank you. That, that's something I'll try and push for in this Congress. Uh, with the remaining use of my time, Ms. Colson, um, my congressional district comprises eight of the main Hawaiian islands. Uh, many, many small communities, former plantation communities. Uh, how can uh, we make the clean water state revolving fund more flexible for small communities in my district? Thank you for that question. Um, I think it's important to recognize the impact of federal mandates on these small communities and in the SRFs to ensure that we can meet the needs of those small communities. And one of the aspects is technical assistance to ensure that they're able to not just uh, get the water infrastructure funded, but also to maintain and operate it and to build the, the rates that they need uh, to renew that infrastructure when it's reached its useful life. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kahaley. Uh, <clears throat> that wraps up all the witness testimony. I'm sorry, I have a, a problem. But I wanted to comment on a few things. First of all, education of the public of so what you're doing and having them aware of how important it is that you're successful in uh, getting funds, not only from the government, but with expenditure funds on, on things like uh, that you're talking about. Uh, I understand uh, that uh, today the uh, 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 California may be in drought, uh, uh, again, so they're, they're, the governor is going to make a statement, I understand, 
the Bureau of Reclamation is saying that 24 month projection of the, uh, the, the Colorado is, is dire. So we are in need of recycled water continuing to grow and help our agencies. But uh, I, Earth, I miss Mr. Earth Day, Mr. Ferranti. Two years now, we haven't had Earth Day, so I miss it. Uh, <laughs> and then maybe uh, there might be some help from Mr. Uh, Kahaley from you in, in the, what, what lessons you've learned, what you can do. But I really uh, I thank everybody. I ask the unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such a time as all our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may have been submitted to them in writing. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. And without objection, so ordered. I'd like to thank all our witnesses again for your helpful and informative testimony today. And I want to thank staff for all their help. If no other members have anything to add, the committee stands adjourned. Stay safe, everybody, and thank you very much.